And hello and welcome. My name is Nathan from Minneapolis Running. And we are joined... I'm going to have to edit this out. <laughs> okay, we can clip the beginning of this. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to the live webinar about gear for your first marathon. My name is Nathan Freeberg from Minneapolis Running, and I am joined today by Jesse Benson from RightFitsRunning.com. And we are going to talk to you about what to wear before during and after your first marathon. Jesse, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Nathan. How about you? Awesome. Very good, very good. I had my last significant uh, run before Twin Cities Marathon yesterday, which went really well. Uh, so that, that felt good. And I know you had a, a pretty good run today yourself. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I had 18 miles yesterday, so it felt good. We had good weather, which makes a big difference. So. Okay. And you're doing Outer Banks Marathon in North Carolina? Yep, I'm doing the Outer Banks Marathon. So it's four weeks after Twin Cities, so it's um, beginning in November. Awesome. And can you just tell everyone, uh, the hundreds of viewers, millions of viewers listening at home, kind of your real quick marathon history? You um, have done quite a few. Yeah, so I, um, I blog at The Right Fits, where I write about running and fitness, and I um, blog about my quest to do a marathon in every state. Which is awesome. Only, which will take a little while, because we're only doing one, two to three a year. But um, that's how we're picking each marathon. Next is uh, North Carolina, which I have never actually been to, so it'll be a fun, fun experience. I have done Twin Cities. Uh, two times, and it's still out of the 16 that I've done. It's one of my favorites. It's a beautiful course, great crowd support, um, one of the best finishes I think when you come up over Summit and you oh, can see totally. the capital. Yeah, I think it's it's really one of the best. So I'm um, definitely impartial to my hometown marathon. So at the Right Fit, so I do I do write about fitness and running, and also fitness fashion. Ooh, so, um, which is very important as a runner to wear the proper, <laughs> well, yeah. appropriate fashions. There's a lot of products out there, and um, I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight about the right fit for before, during, and after your first marathon. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that, Jesse. And why don't just to start things off, what would you say if you could uh, give first-time marathoners just one tip? Because this is... Uh, the series is geared towards people trying to run their first marathon. If you could give them only one tip, what would that be? My biggest tip for your first marathon is to not try anything new in terms of gear on race day. Make sure you've tested out everything that you're going to be wearing and you have it all planned out, and you know, including your, your shoes, your socks, your sports bra, how you're going to keep your hair back, everything, including your socks. I had a friend who wore a new pair of socks that she bought at the expo for Boston Marathon and it ended up giving her a lot of blisters and she lost some toenails and mm. she wanted to take those Ouch. socks off during the race and so she really thought that that kind of ruined the race for her or at least um, is something that she remembered in a really bad way. So I think you need to tr test out everything that you're going to wear on race day. That is definitely my number one rule. Absolutely, and I totally agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that is 100% important. So why don't we just kind of run, uh, run through the list, so from the bottom to the top of kind of what gear. Uh, we'll start with clothing. What kind of clothing should you wear uh, during your marathon? Maybe even talk a little bit about what you wear. Um, I'll share some of my tips. Let's just start with shoes. Yeah, you know, we said in the little advertisement for this webinar that race day gear is more than just shoes, but I think... With that said, shoes are very important, and um, I know what my shoe is. I'm a Brooks Ravenna girl. I wear those. I've been wearing those for years. Solid and, shoe. Yep. And I always buy a new pair just in time for like my last couple of long runs, so that they're fresh. But I have time to break them in um, a little bit before race day. Do not wear a brand new pair of shoes on race day. Terrible idea. Um, even if it's the exact same pair of shoes and you think it'll be fine, I think you really need that time to break them in and make sure they're um, ready for the big 26.2. And how you talk about breaking in shoes, what do you have you found is kind of a magic number or number of miles to break in your shoes? I don't know if there's one exact number, but I, I think you need to make sure you're doing Right now, maybe you have another 10 mile or left. If you buy them now and you do two more weeks of running, probably 30 miles, I think that's probably a good number. Um, 
Nathan, what, what do you think? Do you have a magic number? <laughs> yeah, it's very magical. Um, I, I, I too run, well I run in a different shoe than what I normally train in and for me I found somewhere yeah, around 25-30 miles. Um, last year I bought uh, the new pair of shoes almost right around the same time. About two. Um, I did one long, I think it was about 12 miles uh, in them and then a, a couple little runs. And then I didn't run in them for a couple days before which I think is important as well because you want to give your shoe enough time to kind of spring back and um, be all it can be to support you in those 26.2 miles. So uh, definitely a great tip with that. You know, another tip about your shoes um, is double knot your shoes. Or yeah. Nathan probably has some good information on exactly how to tie your shoes correctly. Yeah, which sounds crazy, but um, and there'll be a link to that in the the show notes. But there's actually a, there's a whole TED talk done on the proper way to tie shoes, not just running shoes, but any shoes, and I always forget which way it goes over when I don't have it in front of me, but yeah, there's a right way and a wrong way, so uh, check out the link uh, below here when you're done watching this. Great. Um, you want to talk about socks. socks at all? What Do you have You know, my, my tip socks? about socks is if you have a pair that you've been running in, don't switch it up. Just make sure it's the same, same kind of socks. Yeah. For sure, and I, I think just something, you know, obviously, you know, wicking and uh, high performance, you don't necessarily need, you know, super expensive socks, but you don't want to be running in cotton socks and anything that's uh, going to bother you, because obviously your feet are kind of important when you're running a marathon. So, um, so moving up, shorts, uh, shorts and kind of up, what are your thoughts? You know, I have a couple of girlfriends who I run with who won't wear shorts for the marathon, even though they train in shorts. They always are like, I have this pair of capris um, that I love, and I know that they're going to be perfect for Twin Cities Marathon. So um, if you are more comfortable at, as a female wearing capris, you know that they're not going to chafe you, you know, go with those. There's a lot of really good shorts out there, though, um, that have a lot of pocket space, which is great. So you can have all your goos and whatever else you need to carry with you. Wear what you've been running in that you haven't had any chafing problems with. Absolutely. And if you haven't by now tested out your shorts, uh, you want to wear those um, as much as you can. Here are my race shorts. Um, the Elite series, which I feel helps make me faster. Um, but what I like about these are two things. Is One, uh, they don't chafe, and they have this little pocket in the back that I can get two um, or three goos in there, and I have pretty good access to it. There's also another little pocket um, somewhere up front that's really not much bigger than a key to kind of store a key in there. But again, wear those ahead of time, wash them a couple times, and just make sure that they feel great. Uh, Jesse, what about running skirts? What are your fashion... Tip. Yep. Well, you know, I, I, I haven't run in fashion skirt or in the running skirts in a while, but I do think they look really nice, and they actually often have built-in shorts underneath. So um, those are often pretty good quality. They don't ride up. They don't chafe. So I think if you have a running skirt that you really like, it gives it a little bit of a feminine touch, and I think they can look really, really cute. Absolutely. Which. It's important. It's very important. And, uh, you know, for guys, you know, if that's if that's your thing, go for it. I don't know if they make them in masculine colors or not, but whatever. <laughs> moving on. Uh, keep going. Yeah, so moving on from shorts, moving up would be um, sports bras. And I think... Again, for ladies. Shoes, yep, in addition to shoes, having a good... Supportive sports bra is really important. It doesn't matter if you're you know, big or small or medium size. Having a sports bra that stays and supports you for that 26.2 miles of bouncing around is really important. I think Moving Comfort is one of the best um, sports bra businesses out there. And most running stores that carry Moving Comfort, they usually have somebody who works there who can size you in the right size sports bra. So if you haven't yet, I would say go into a store like The Running Room in Uptown. They carry Moving Comfort, and they have really good female staff who can help size you. Lululemon carries um, the Biddy Bracer and the Tata Tamer, which are great sports those are real, Those are real names? <laughs> real names. Wow, great okay. okay. Um, so I think plan ahead and, and find a good sports bra that works for, your, for you. And then another thing to think about, which maybe you haven't thought about, is how to keep your hair out of your face. Now, make sure you carry an extra hair binder on your wrists 
in case yours breaks on you. That would not be fun. And then I'm a big fan of the big bands and the sweaty bands, which you can wear. They have a velvet on the underneath, so they really stay in place really well and keep your hair out of your place. And they come in a variety of colors, neon, sparkly, beautiful. polka dots. I have um, the custom ones from different marathons that I've done. This is from the Flying Pig Marathon. We've had like custom ones made for my running club. And nice. you know you can cuss, you can match whatever outfit you're wearing. They'll they'll be selling them at the Twin Cities Expo. So if you want to get one that day, I think they're really great to keep your hair out of your face. But I think it's important to make sure that you know what you're going to do to make sure your hair isn't a distraction on race day. Absolutely, and I, you know I think it's important too for guys. You know, like I have longer hair for guy, and I actually wear this is my race day sweatband. Um, nice. I got this at the uh, Twin Cities Marathon Expo uh, a number of years ago now. There's no brand markings on it. I don't know who makes it, uh, but it's awesome. I think Jesse just fell over. Um, also, you know, hats are great too. Dry fit hats um, are wonderful to wear. Uh, visors, kind of whatever you've been training in, uh, wear that. But um, as Jesse mentioned, keeping you know your hair out of your face and even the sweat out of your face after yeah. three and a half, four hours of running, that's definitely probably going to be an issue unless you're some kind of superhuman non, non-sweating person. But, but right. uh, Jesse, do you make any of those? Like if people wanted to buy a custom glitter band, do you make those? <laughs> you know, I don't, but I, you know, I can have nothing but nice things to say about the woman behind Big Bands because she's been great to work with when I wanted customized ones. So I would push you towards her website if you are interested in them. And like I said, they do sell them at the Twin Cities Expo. And they work really, really well. I've tried a lot of different headbands, and I'm kind of a um, stickler about getting my hair out of my face. So I think that these are like the best to awesome. keep your hair out of your face. Mm-hmm. Jesse's so a bit of a headband that's, expert. I'm a bit of a headband expert. It's true. So that's all stuff that's kind of more for the ladies or the guys with longer hair. Um, moving up from there, I think we wanted to talk about arm warmers. Yes, arm warmers. I love arm warmers. Um, and I just want to show, so uh, the 30, so this is the 33rd, this is probably going to be backwards, I don't know how this works, um, but so these are from the 30th anniversary of the Twin Cities Marathon, arm warmers, made by Fitsock, just for that occasion, and I love them. Um, they're super lightweight, and I actually race in just a, a singlet, and these things, I wore them last year when it was like 50 degrees, and uh, I was perfectly comfortable during the whole race. Someone actually asked us a question about whether or not they should wear, uh, you know, stick with a sleeveless or wear long sleeves, and obviously that's going to be dependent on, you know, if you're a really, really hot runner or what the weather is like that day, obviously. Um, But for me, again, it was like 50 degrees, and I just had on a racing singlet, um, which is basically a tank top, just a fancy uh, running term. Uh, And these lovely arm warmers that were free, you can buy them, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars, but... Um, or Jessie actually has some homemade ones that she likes to use. Well, you know, I've used the store-bought ones, and I, I think some people think they look kind of silly, but I, I really like them. I think that they do a really good job of keeping your core warm, um, and then you can always shed them if you want to. And if you're worried about shedding them, if you've paid money for them, you can always make your own out of, like, a tube sock from Target um, that does the same thing, and then you don't have to worry about throwing them to the side as you warm up. Mm-hmm. But it is, someone had a question about, you know, kind of what do you do? Do you toss stuff off or whatever? And, yeah, absolutely. You know, you might consider bringing something disposable that you are going to peel off a few miles into the race and just chuck it. The nice thing is that Twin Cities Marathon uh, takes all that stuff to, I don't know exactly where, but they do uh, donate it. So um, bring an old shirt that you don't like or maybe doesn't match your headband anymore and find you know, someone you can give it to. I actually sometimes have even tossed stuff to friends or family members or uh, even people I don't know that well, but I say, hey, I have your email. I'm going to get this back later from you. So, sure. uh, Jesse, any other, kind of as we're transitioning a little bit into weather adaptations, any any other um, recommendations or suggestions that you have for dealing with cold weather, hot weather, rainy weather, snowy weather, haily weather? It is Minnesota, so, you know, who knows what it's yeah. going to be. You know, weather is something I think you're probably stressing about quite a bit. You're probably waiting until that 10-day forecast is out so you can see what the weather is. I think you should be looking at it. It's good to be prepared and to know 
um, what you're dealing with and what to wear. So there's a lot of things that could happen in Minnesota in October. Um, it could be really cold. It could be really hot. Um, I've run when it was pouring rain, so it can be raining the whole time. Um, I think Nathan, you ran it in 2008 when it was pouring as well. Right? Yeah, that, I think that was a that was a terrible experience uh, you know, for me. I, it just I was so wet. I don't know. How did did you like that? It wasn't as bad as heat, uh, at least in terms of my performance. I think heat is harder on me. I think the rain was tough. They had a lot of blisters, but it was pretty amazing that Twin Cities had, still has such great crowd support, even on oh, yeah. a really rainy, miserable day. Mm -hmm. And it was hard enough to be a runner, but to be standing out there cheering for people, you know, I, that's, I can't say enough about the Twin Cities crowds are really great. But if it is going to be rainy, there's lots of things you can do to prepare. You can start in a poncho, um, and then you can just kind of throw it off as you warm up, or even a garbage bag. Everybody it, loves a good poncho, right? <laughs> right. Um, visors will help keep the rain on your face. And body glide. I would say um, use a lot of body glide. I have some here on the ground. <laughs> yes. Like bring body glide if it's raining. Um, those are my tips for the rain. Do you have any additional tips for the rain? You know, I would just add to that um, that this year, since uh, those of you running Twin Cities Marathon may or may not know this, but the Metrodome is no longer available to wait in uh, before the race. And so, uh, you're going to want to bring maybe a garbage bag, maybe two garbage bags, in addition to your poncho, because you're not going to have a dry, warm spot to wait. And so just kind of think that and take that into consideration as you're planning and watching the weather forecast, what do you need, what additional stuff might help you in that situation. Um, I would just add, too, and we have this as a whole separate bullet point later, but we may as well talk about it now. Body Glide or Vaseline, this is actually called Run Guard, same idea, though. Um, can't say enough about this stuff. and Chafing, I don't think, is a, a thing that is only for certain runners. I think it happens to everybody, and after, again, three, four, five hours on your feet, uh, this 99-cent uh, tub of Vaseline might be the best investment you've ever made. Um, if you haven't had issues with it during your long runs, you may not during the race, or you may. There's something about those last you know, 6.2 miles that really uh, are really, really brutal. The only other thing I would just add is kind of common sense if you would rest at all, just the idea of layering. And again, repeating what we just said, but you know, kind of peeling stuff off and just preparing for that. Um, Jesse, you mentioned before when we were talking just about, um, so when it comes to layering and where to put your race bib, you know, let's say that you have a sweatshirt on or something because it's freezing cold, so you pin it on your sweatshirt and then all of a sudden you get hot. Are you trapped into wearing that sweatshirt the whole race because your race bib is there? What do you do? Well, I believe for Twin Cities, your um, t tracker, your time tracker, is on the back of your bib. I don't think I it's think on your shoe anymore. Oh, it's not. It's okay. Okay. Uh, well, I thought it was. On, that's a good question. Actually, I think it's. I think it's a chip still on your shoe. But okay. You, you if it's could a chip be right. on your shoe, it's not the end of the world if you don't have your bib. But um, you won't get your summit beer at the end if you don't have your bib, and you won't get your pictures along the course because they won't know who you are. You'd have to search through all the hundreds of pictures, and if this is your first marathon. You're going to want to have a picture of your first time. So my advice is put your bib on your bottom layer. Um, when you run through those photo ops, lift your shirt up and show your number. <laughs> or as you're shedding layers, you'll have your number on the bottom, and then you don't have to worry about it, because most likely you will heat up, and you'll be shedding those layers, and you'll come down to the bottom layer where your number is. But it's probably best to keep the number on the bottom layer versus having it on the sweatshirt that you're most likely going to be throwing off. Yeah, for sure. And there's, you know, kind of a saying, I don't know if it's saying, but you know, you always want to start a marathon colder, or you always want to start cold, meaning, um, you know, you're going to start probably a little chilly because you're going to warm up, you know, especially even throughout the day, it's probably going to warm up as well. So it's okay if you're cold at the beginning. And mm -hmm. I can't remember if we already said this, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but some people actually have a throwaway uh, sweatshirt or something that they wear literally seconds before the race or before the gun goes off, and they just chuck it to the side um, right before they take off. So that's another thing that you can do as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I think we've kind of covered clothing, uh, shoes, socks, shorts, tops, and head. Um, oh, sunglasses. Um, Jesse, I can't remember. Are you a sunglass wearer? I love sunglasses. These are a 
um, a super expensive pair of Iron Man sunglasses I got at Target for $15. And um, I've had them for years and years and years, and they just won't break. I love them. It makes me feel fast. Um, what's your take on the whole sunglass thing? Yeah, I also have a pair of not very expensive sunglasses that I usually wear if it's going to be sunny, and I think it makes a really big difference. You're not squinting the whole time, and it almost feels less hot if you're wearing sunglasses. It does. Maybe it's a mental thing. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of sunglasses, but make sure you're trying them out on your long runs and you find a pair that you're not going to be pulling up on your nose the whole time, um, that don't bother you, that don't fog up. But I think that they're investing a little bit in a pair that fits you well is is really good because Twin Cities could be really pretty sunny. Not yeah. very shiny. Yeah. yeah. Well, well said, well said. Um, let's transition now um, with our last, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left here. So uh, we had a couple questions before about kind of fuel belts and what to wear around your waist. Should you wear something? Uh, my first marathon actually ran with a camelback, which if you don't want that, know what that is, it's a backpack with a 64 ounce, mine was, 64 ounce water bladder in the back, which was awesome because it was super convenient to drink from. But after about 15, 16 miles, I actually absolutely dreaded it. And I wasn't going to toss it uh, because those things are like 70 bucks. Um, but I hated it. And so now I actually don't wear anything uh, when I race um, any distance uh, because I found that the water stops um, are plenty adequate. Um, last week we talked more about fueling and how to navigate those water stops, so you can rewatch that one to find out some tips about that. Um, Jesse, what's your take? You've done 16 marathons now. Do you carry something with you? Do you not? Do you just rely on the course? What's your, what's your take? I think most marathons, definitely Twin Cities, have a, plenty of support. Twin Cities is every two miles and then every mile towards the end. So you won't need a fuel belt. If you feel more comfortable and you've been training with one and you just, for your confidence and you want to keep it, wear it. I'm not going to tell you not to. Or a handheld water bottle, if that makes you feel more comfortable, you're used to just having it along the way, continue to do so. But I think at a, a well-organized um, marathon like Twin Cities, you don't you don't necessarily need one, and it can almost become annoying. And if you're getting frustrated at the end, you're probably gonna wish you didn't have yeah, it. Totally, I, I completely agree. I was uh, two marathons ago. I was running up Summit, and I took mine off and chucked it to a friend because it was it was just kept falling down and it was just completely worthless. So that's another reason why I don't use them anymore. Um, what about these things? These uh, this is actually an amphibopod, but same kind of idea. Do you? Yeah. Do you like these? Yep, um, the fanny packs, as I call them. Those are, I, <laughs> Running I do fanny like packs those. are so back I in think, style now. <laughs> I think those are great. I think you can fit a lot of stuff in those. If you did need to carry your phone with you, or maybe you wanted to carry a camera, those can actually fit quite a bit. And you can carry more goos in there if your shorts don't have, if you're wearing those capris like my friends are that don't have a lot of pockets, then you can fit a lot in those little belts. But just make sure you're tra testing them out and you're, you know that they fit well and they're not going to bug you because you're going to have that on for you know several hours and you don't want it to drive you crazy. Yeah, but and I think they, they can work really well. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to your number one rule, you know, don't try anything new. So again, if you haven't been training with something like that, don't hear this and think, oh, I need to go out and get that. If you want to and try it out on your next long run, whatever that is, and if you like it, great. Mm -hmm. um, but if not, again, like Jesse said, they have water, water and Powerade every two or three miles up to like mile 17, and then it's every mile through the finish um, right. or something like that. I don't have that right in front of me. But uh, watch out because there will be other people along the course handing out non-official items such yes. as beer or champagne, and so don't you know take something without knowing what it is before. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I will admit that I took a banana out of some guy's hand. He was clearly not with any officially sanctioned aid station. Um, I was just not doing well, and it, it tasted really good. So, But be careful. People will be handing out candy, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, beer even. Just, yeah, don't take that. Um, it's sort of a little tangent back into fueling, but that can derail people. I've heard of um, other runners talk about they you know, took something and it just made them sick because obviously they you know, weren't used to training with a Hershey's candy bar or whatever it was that they got. So... Uh, watch out for that. Um, one last thing I just wanted to talk about really quickly is gloves. Um, so if it's cold, um, you might want to go to Home Depot, Menards, and pick up a pair of these, like, 10 for a dollar 
um, knit gloves. Um, I have found these keep my hands perfectly warm, um, and they're crazy cheap, so it doesn't matter if you throw them away. And then you might actually get a pair of these in your um, race bag when you go pick up your packet. So, um, Jesse, let's talk a little bit, kind of rewinding to before the race. So we mentioned garbage bags. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that you think a uh, first-time marathoner may not think about when it comes to what do I wear before the race as I'm walking or driving uh, down to the starting line? What should I have? Well, something to do at home before the race that morning is to put your name on your shirt. So oh, Yeah, uh, that's right. We I haven't talked that. about that yet. And we haven't, but thank you for bringing it up. The really speedy guys, they don't like to do it. My husband doesn't like to do it either, but I think it really helps. Um, it, as a, an enthusiastic TCM spectator, I really like to have um, you have your name on your shirt so that I can cheer for you more than just saying, go, you know, blue shirt guy. I like to be able to say, go Nathan, um, it, and it seems go to mean more. Yeah, <laughs> as a runner, I, I mean, I, when I'm running too, I really appreciate having somebody cheer for me. So I think that makes a big difference. So you can use um, marker or you can use like electrical or plastic tape like this and just cut out the letters and put them across your shirt. They stay on pretty well. I mean, unless it's, you know, pouring rain, they might come off, but I think that works pretty or well. If you're to sweating get a lot. Or if you're sweating a lot, <laughs> you can put it in marker on your arm. And then another thing about before the race is maybe take a picture of yourself and your what you're wearing so that all of your family and friends um, who are spectating will be able to spot you in the crowd because there's a lot of people cities is, can be condensed and kind of crowded at certain points, and I think it's helpful to, for your friends and family to know what you're wearing mm -hmm. before you um, pass them by. Yeah, I actually like to, to put everything on the night before, one, so that I just know it's all organized in the same place, but as Jesse mentioned, just stick, um, take a photo and text it to everybody because, um, yeah, it can be hard to kind of pick out uh, mm -hmm. who you're cheering for. Um, going back to, you know, writing your name on your shirt, I, I, so Josie and I were joking earlier, I don't like to do it just because I don't, it's just, I don't know, not my thing. I did it during one race and it, uh, I just kind of found it annoying, but I do like, I do like the idea of it, I just don't do it. I feel like, you know, even that little bit of extra tape might weigh me down and, you know, I want every, every ounce of uh, extra speed I can get. Um, uh, speaking of sticking things on, we didn't talk about band-aids yet. Um, right. Uh, so <laughs> go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thanks. Uh, so band-aids. You may this is for the guys. I don't know if it's for ladies. So I'm just talking to guys. Sometimes you, there can be some uh, chafage of your nipples, men, and leading to the bloody shirts. If you Google that or YouTube that, you can find some funny uh, race videos. Um, that's up to you. Uh, if you want to do that as a first-time marathon, you've probably never thought about that, or maybe you've heard horror stories about that. Um, but just keep in mind that that's something that you may, if you ever had any maybe rawness there during your rate, during a long run, uh, the marathon can be the thing that actually really kind of makes it the worst feeling in the world. So think about that ahead of time. The other thing is just kind of before the race, um, you know, you have to pack in your sweat check bag everything that you want after the race, which we're going to talk about in a second. And so in that bag, you want to pack, um, or you're going to be wearing some of that stuff, and then you're going to shove it in the bag, and then you're going to bring it to the sweats uh, check spot. And I think what I just wanted to kind of point out about that is that you have to get all that stuff into the, to the truck, which they then take to the finish line 15 minutes before the race starts. So the marathon starts at 8, which means you have to have everything in, in that bag, in the truck by 7.45 and be at the starting line. So there is going to be that kind of, gap where you might be really cold or whatever. That's okay, as we mentioned before. But just keep in mind that before the race, um, you're going to want to be wearing, you know, sweatpants, sweatshirts, something to keep you warm, and then just make sure everything fits in that bag. Um, uh, one year, this actually happened to me where I, I packed my bag the night before. I had sweatpants, a sweatshirt, everything. And then I wore another set of sweatpants, sweatshirt to the race. And then kind of when I was waiting in line for the bathroom, it just dawned on me this is not going to all fit in that bag. And so I had to, I actually, um, true story, I actually hid, uh, hid my stuff um, kind of in some bushes around the Metrodome and then came back, I think it was actually the next day, and kind of dug around it, uh, dug around and fished it out. Um, so make sure that doesn't happen to you because it's awkward. Um, anything to add to that, Jesse? 
Um, and nothing else, race. I think, before the race. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's good to be cold. There's going to be a period of time where you're going to be cold, but trust me, it's better than standing there and being hot at the start because that means you're in for a rough marathon. Yes. So um, it's okay to be cold. If you need to bring you know, fuel, we talked about last week, but if you have fuel in your bag, make sure that's all in there. Um, but I think that's pretty good for before the race. Yeah. So I think we could probably move on to what to pack or what to have available for after. Yeah, and, and you may want to bring uh, like a travel size uh, Kleenex package because mm. uh, you never want to be stuck in a porta potty without toilet paper. But um, that's just maybe a extra precautionary step. But yeah, let's talk about after. So Jesse, what what are some things you're going to want after the race? Yeah, after the race, you're going to want to have in your gear check bag some warm clothes. Even if um, you feel warm at the end, all the time it takes you to get through the shoot to find your gear check bag, meet up with your family, you're probably going to start to get pretty chilly. And I know someone asked um, if we, if Twin Cities hands out those face blankets or those whatever. The foil, the big huge pieces of foil that you can wrap yourself in. And, yep, uh, and then we'll have those. So that'll help at, right at the finish, you'll be able to have that on and be warm. Um, but I think you want to make sure in your bag you have warm sweatpants and a sweatshirt, maybe um, dry socks or different pair of shoes or flip flops. Flop. Yep, flip flop, uh, so that you're feeling warm and cozy while you're waiting around, taking celebratory pictures, maybe drinking your Summit beer that they're serving this year. Uh, you want to feel warm, not freezing. Yeah, and that's something that you know. Again, uh, Jesse kind of reminded me the other day. You know, don't it's not doesn't do any good to kind of freak out about the weather because you can't obviously change it, but it'll just help how you prepare for it mentally, possibly physically, and then also like you know what you're going to wear after the race. So. Um, you know, keep in mind that it is going to be cold. You are, you know, you just ran for several hours and your body's been generating all this heat and then you just stop and so it stops doing that and you can get cold very, very quickly, um, which is not good. Uh, the other thing that I actually just thought about is they, you'll get your finisher shirt um, at the shoot as well. So um, that can be an, an extra layer that you put on that you may not need to pack um, in your bag because you'll have that. So uh, just kind of think about that because those bags aren't very big and you have to use the official bag with your name on it and your um, your race number. So, uh, Jesse, as we kind of wrap this up here, is there anything else that you you think is important to know? I'm just looking over some of our notes here. We covered the arm warmers. We talked about the belt. We talked about the space blanket. Um, what else? Oh, how about compression socks? And some people may want to bring compression socks in their gear check bag. Uh, I've tried them, and I know. A lot of people really swear by them. They think it really helps in your recovery. So if you want to bring those, I think that's a good idea to have those in your bag to try those out. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's a post, um, depending on when you watch this, on Minneapolis Running, um, a new one, about compression socks. I just started using them. And so I dug into a little bit of the research. And long story short is that they're really, they can be helpful to aid recovery after race, especially if you're going to be traveling um, really any distance, but there really is no proof that they help during a race. Um, so, but after a race, they can be just kind of feel like nice little tiny massages on your legs. So, um, but they are like 50 bucks, so it's not exactly a, you know, it's, well, it is a splurge purchase. It's a purchase. It's not something you want to just, you know, pick up just in case unless you have 50 extra bucks lying around. Um, the other thing I would add is in your bag for after the race, yes, they give you food and you know, broth and chips and other stuff, but maybe pack some, you know, a little a bar of some kind or a protein shake. Um, it's not really here that's kind of fueling, but it's something that will be helpful after as you're navigating the end of the uh, end of the race. So, anything else, Jesse? I think we've hit all of the high points here. Um, yeah, I think we've hit the high points and the low points. I think we've got it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the low. What would be some of the low points? Probably the chafing and the yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you so much, Jesse, for doing this. And next well, week we're going to be talking. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> next week we're going to be talking about uh, your race day strategy and kind of pacing and what does that look like for you, as well as giving you some last minute tips on your taper, which hopefully you're already doing and already um, kind of resting up for that big day. Um, so, no other final words from you, Jesse. I think that's it. All right, then good luck, everyone. Hopefully you are feeling awesome and excited about your first marathon. 
And we will see you next Thursday, September 25th at 9 p.m. Goodbye. Bye.